Well, the reason I'm giving you this uh, handout here, calling we're calling it a 20-year journey for such a time as this, I believe we're at the 20-year mark in terms of a uh, beginning when uh, the word of the Lord came in 1982 in St. Louis by the audible voice of the Lord, which really began to uh, begin uh, the thing that we're about right now. I mean, it began before that in the heart of God and then even... Ten years before before me and others uh, with Bob Jones, but in terms of my involvement of calling and rallying the people together, it's been a twenty year journey. Now it's impossible to to uh, uh, capture all the main ideas, but uh, the real the real thing on my heart tonight is the same as tomorrow night, and tomorrow night will will be uh, a very significant. It'll be our twelfth uh, evening and the final one, and the ending, the 50 days of waiting on the Lord together, the extravagant devotion period of, and uh, and I'm going to share, and I'm going to give you a handout, the most significant prophetic word I've ever received in my life uh, about the corporate move of God related to this place. And it is confirmed in a, it was confirmed in a very uh, magnificent way. I've never shared it ever before. Yeah, I, I gave a handout with a few uh, uh, points on it, but nothing comprehensive a couple of years ago pertaining to one point. But uh, I'm going to give a handout. It's the first time I've done it with any kind of uh, fullness of it, uh, uh, of, of the message. And that's tomorrow night. So tonight and tomorrow night, the real theme is the worldwide end of the age calling of the prayer movement that God has established in this place and others that are like it. But I'm really focusing on here. But... Uh, the truths can can be applied in other places as well. Now, I have it broken down in eight different periods, and obviously there's much overlap because the Lord doesn't just lay things out neatly. He lays it out according to an administration of life, and so there's there's overlap of one season to the other, yet there's very clear Holy Spirit distinctives, very clear Holy Spirit uh, emphasis going on. Matt, this just keeps coming to me. The Lord has got you in a key place right now. It just keeps coming on me ever since I started. The Lord has you in a key place. Matt Candler, he's, a, he's got a hold of your heart, and he's going to follow through with getting a hold of your heart right now. Okay, uh, got that out of the way. First Roman numeral is uh, the thing the Lord established in the first three years. And, of course, he's done it for 20, but really emphasized it to, uh, I mean, second to nothing was the prophetic ministry. I talk a lot about 83 and 84, but really I have to talk about 82, 83, and 84. And the number one theme of the prophetic was end-time revivals coming. Now, that's a, a real common idea to many of us, but in my life, uh, that was a time where every time it seemed, that's, this is, this is overstating it, but every time I seemed to turn around, there was some dynamic thing happening where God was saying, in time, revival is going to take place, and He was doing it in a prophetic way. I gave just some of the key, uh, the key, uh, testimonies there. By no means all. I just wanted to get, give, to give you a feel for it. Roman numeral two. The next three years was intercession. Now, we were doing the intercession in 82, 83, 84. But at the end of 84, October 84, we began uh, at the church six hours a day. Now, I've never, ever entered into intercession at that level in a corporate group of people. So at the end of 1984, but it was all 85, 86, 87, and it, it went on be, uh, beyond that. But the reason I would uh, separate those three years because that was nearly the only thing we did was intercession. To the consternation of many who wanted to release this and start that and this and that and this and that. And very legitimate desires. And we started a little bit. But uh, if, I, if I had to weigh all the time of the ministry of, of the church, it was probably about 95%. It was nearly 100% focus. We had prayer meetings is what we did. And I used to get up and tell people, if you are a member of this church, you go to prayer meetings. And one of these days, we're going to have other things to do. We're going to get youth ministries and everything going at other levels. But for now, we had a little bit of that going on. We have prayer meetings. 
And so that's what the focus was. The prophetic uh, testimonies, a few of them happen. Nothing like the 82 to 84. Nothing like that. But we, but the prayer that was going on was focused, concentrated. Yes, unanointed. Yes, boring. But focused and concentrated. And it was center stage of everything this church and my life and my ministry was about. Now I'm going to highlight uh, an interesting one I have December 19th, 1985. Very, very key event. I can't give you a lot on it. I have more than I can say because it wouldn't be appropriate to say a lot. But there's a man named Tim Golden who died that day. And, uh, and the reason I'm putting it on here, because there's many, many prophetic uh, events and testimonies that aren't, aren't on this page. It's only one page handout. I mean, how many things have I given? It, it would fill many pages. But uh, uh, this is a thing very holy to the Lord, and it had... A lot of uh, prophetic significance, again, that I can't fully go out into. It began, uh, my relationship to Tim began in September 1984, when Augustine, the uh, young prophetic guy, and Bob Jones, the older prophetic guy, both of them, one from out of town, one from in town, gave me a separate word with no uh, uh, connection with one another. And I have uh, confidence about that because I really inquired into it. And uh, both of them heard the, the Lord speak to them and said, Timothy is coming. Actually, it was young Timothy is coming. Timothy is coming. And then about six months later, I meet this guy, or a few months later, Timothy, and he begins to tell me uh, his story, and he moves to Kansas City uh, in December 84. And then December 85, a year later, he dies. He dies on December 19th. That's very significant because it was his 37th birthday. And uh, Tim Golden, uh, I'm not telling this for sentimental reasons. Uh, I, I am sentimental about it, but that's not why I'm doing it, because uh, that would be for another setting. He was the first prophet slash intercessor in our movement. The first, I was an intercessor, and Bob Jones was a prophet. We had a number of prophetic people and a number of intercessors, but nobody who was fully both of them. And the Lord sent him in a very key way by speaking to prophets ahead of time his name. And it was very clear he was the Timothy. But the interesting thing, he came from, and I, I'm going to leave it unnamed. Anybody my age, I'm 47, anybody my age knows what I'm talking about. But uh, I just like to leave uh, things, negative things unnamed. But he came from the most dynamic prayer ministry in the Western world in the 70s. Uh, I would almost go as far to say, and maybe I'm, I'm a mess, but to my knowledge, and I've done a little bit of research on the prayer movement over the years, uh, not only the most dynamic one in the 90s, probably the most dynamic prayer ministry and the first one in the Western world of any worldwide dimension, certainly in, in the second half of the 20th century, if, if, if not the whole of the 20th century, I don't know. They were enlisting hundreds of thousands of intercessors worldwide. And he was in the primary leadership team. He helped birth it, start it, ran the prayer meetings, and a whole bunch of things. And the Lord gave this gathering of people a calling to uh, bring together prophetic and intercession, which I believe that calls on a number of places, by the way. And the Lord just spoke audibly to uh, our prophets. I mean, by the audible voice of God to one of them, I believe by a dream to another, and uh, spoke to him by a prophetic dream. He came here. He did not know us. He came from that place. And the Lord said, uh, told him, join him. So he's our first prophet intercessor. He's come out of a, the most dynamic, if not the first, movement in the Western world of any worldwide scope to it. Certainly uh, in the last 50 years. And uh, he was a picture. And the day before he died, uh, I lived, first they, they moved into our house. Lived with us for some time, for, for may, I don't know, some months, two, three, four, five, six months. And then they moved right next door. So I, uh, my memory's blurred because they moved next door. So I can't remember. We still did the same, same thing. So we were all there together. But, uh, so we drove to almost all the permies together in the morning. He went morning, noon, and night, just like Noel Alexander, morning, noon, and night. He never missed one, just like Noel Alexander for all those, for a number of years. Uh, Noel did that. And, and the night before he died, he, he said, Mike, he goes, uh, I believe it was a Monday night, but again, the meetings were every night, so I can't remember for sure. But he said, uh, Mike, he said, uh, strangest thing. He goes, tomorrow's my 37th birthday. And uh, he says, I wrote in my journal, it's the year of death, which he died physically the next day. And I said, year of death? What's that mean? And he gave me some uh, things about the place he was at. He gave me some play things about his own life. He gave me some just some ideas, and I don't know how many of them are... are uh, 
you know, fully prophetic, but he was just speaking out of the abundance of his heart. Some of it was really prophetic. And he said, the Lord said, he goes, I don't know all that it means, age 37, the year of death, but I'm sure it means something, and it is prophetic, and I know it's about this place. I know it's about his own life. I know it's about the place I was, and he went on and on and on, and that's as much as I'm going to give to it. And uh, he died. And there's a lot there's a lot more to that story, but I just wanted to say it for the sake of God and the angels. I just like to say it for the... Meaning, because it's holy to the Lord, all that's meant in that. I just wanted it on our testimony as I'm talking here in this 11th night about the uh, worldwide dimension of the prayer ministry that God's raised up here. Because he was a critical dimension physically and spiritually in his connectedness to the other movement. Many, many things. But anyway, I said it and now my heart's at peace about it. Okay, so that was the... uh, the second uh, season. The third season, compassion and worship. The Lord was really adamant about marrying together prophetic intercession, worship, and compassion. Those four things. That's something we've said for many, many years. That's a divine revelation uh, that the Lord was going to do that. Even here in Roman number three, the, the worship, put the word intimacy, because worship and intimacy uh, had a, uh, worship is more than intimacy, but it was it was worship that flows out of intimacy was the divine mandate. It's not worship in which intimacy is the ceiling on it, though that's a pretty pretty good ceiling. But uh, worship involves more than intimacy, but it's its foundation. It's, it's life flow in every other expression of worship flows out of that. The prophetic worship that looses even the judgment of God and the prophetic worship that stops the judgment of God all flows out of intimacy. But uh, it was in that season... It's, it's the July 88 when the Lord spoke Song of Solomon 8.6. One, one story I, I didn't get a chance to tell, which is really, really dynamic. It was uh, December 89. December 89. Oh, this was a powerful one. Short but powerful. We were uh, over at the uh, Lee Summit congregation that we had just planted. December 89. We planted it in October 89. Now it's December. And Noel Alexander had this unction of God on him that he had received a word from the Lord that morning about Matthew 22, 37. You shall love the Lord your God. And uh, he was prophesying it. I mean, he was not preaching it. He was prophesying it because the Lord had spoken it to him significantly. And he was saying something like this. I don't know the exact words, but, and this is so important to God. And God said, this is what we're about. And this is what, and he says, and the Lord says, you shall love the Lord. And he was going to say, you're God of all your heart. When he said, you shall love the Lord, a, a bolt of lightning struck the building with such fierceness, force and fierceness, the whole group screamed, lights went wild, sound system reeled, and we were in the fear of God, in the awe of God. It wasn't just the sound scared us, therefore I call it the awe of God. No, the sound scared us, so we had a little bit of the human thing, but there was a presence, there was a, we looked at one another and we knew that God if there was any question mark as to whether that was true, we knew that God turned it into an exclamation point. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 would have lightning from heaven in the spirit and the natural on it. God would enforce, you shall love the Lord your God. Anyway, he was uh, emphasizing compassion and worship and increase. And I need to add the word there. Uh, I, I, it belongs there. Controversy. It was the time of controversy. Controversy as well. Okay, uh, Roman numeral four. It was a couple of three years of there, there, there was not a particular new theme, but it was a time when God was saying, now go deeper. I've given you foundational truths. I've laid it all out for you. Now, now let it be seasoned in it. Go deep in it. And many things happened in that. I, I mentioned the November 95 when the Lord gave the dream about Hephzibah and said, call my people Hephzibah. November 96, the Cindy Belke dream about beauty, the beauty of God. The, there was many, many things that happened where the Lord confirmed the things from the 10 years, from 82 to 92, and we, we went deeper in them. And the messages developed, developed from, a, you know, a level one to a level two. And we were real locked in to four things. Prophetic, intercession, compassion, and worship, and going deep on it. Roman numeral five would have been the transition year. Roman numeral six, 
uh, for a two-year period where the message would have come forth, Roman rule seven, the three years, getting the, uh, uh, the foundational years in place. When we, the very day that we started IHOP, May 7th, I said, and then our, you know, our second anniversary is September 19th because that's when, uh, we went 24-7. May 7th, we just started 13 hours a day of 1999. And I said, on both of those days, I said, it's going to be a three years of, of foundation time. I said, I'm really sure about, I mean, I'm really, uh, clear that, that we're going to spend three years. Not, I'm not saying only three years, but uh, it happens. I didn't know it back then, but it just so happens at the three-year mark, the Lord has called us. We started this 50 days uh, period of, of uh, extravagant devotion on September 19th, the third-year birthday. And uh, we're, this is a transition. Whenever the Lord calls a long extended fast, like the one that so many are on right now, it is a transition for birthing. And I use the word transition like in birthing. We are in the transition process. We are in the birth canal. We are in transition. And that's what this 50 days of fasting is really, really about. And uh, we're going to begin after the One Thing Conference at the uh, New Year's, we have, the, you know, the well, all the young adults come together. After that, I tell you, we are going to a new season. And I believe it's going to be launched in, even in that conference. Okay. So that's a little overview. Now I'm going to fill in some of the blanks on some of the things that that uh, uh, need, to, need to be shared to understand this. Again, I, uh, I have to leave out so many details. Uh, I have to first talk about meeting Paul Cain. How, how I came to, how I met Paul Cain, because the way God introduced Paul Cain was very, very important. And uh, because Paul Cain was a critical strategic introduction to this place, just in the nick of time, nine months before the uh, John Wimber meeting would come. Because Mike Bickle without Paul Cain, uh, John Wimber would not have been very interested in. It was really the combination. John Wimber was really interested in Paul Cain. But Paul Cain, the Lord introduced him through here to there. And so uh, the whole package went together. And so, uh, it's, it was so, as I look at it at the 20 year picture, it was just marvelous how the Lord established that just nine months, which was just the minute before in, in the real reality. What had happened, my story with Paul Cain began with Augustine Nicola, the young, uh, uh, prophet who died in 1996. And, uh, this is in 84 and he's telling me about all of these prophetic guys. And he said, well, the greatest prophet I've ever heard of that I know is a man named Paul Cain. I said, well, when did he die? He goes, he did and he's alive. I go, there is a prophet alive? I, I mean, the greatest one you've ever heard of? Because he, he was telling me the stories of all these prophets, and we were exchanging stories. He goes, yeah, he's alive. Nobody knows where he's at. He's tucked away far away somewhere. And I go, well, let's find him. And he goes, nobody knows. He's kind of in hiding or something. He's been uh, kind of been hiding for years. We're driving. It's a five-hour drive from Phoenix to... Uh, so, to a Southern California, we were going to a, actually a Wimber conference. And I didn't know John Wimber, but we were going to one in, in uh, uh, September 84, I believe it was. Yes, that I could. Yeah, it was. And so, uh, and we're talking to him. I said, I, wait. I said, well, he's the greatest prophet you've ever heard of, and you're a prophet? And I, no, we're going to find him. He says, well, good luck. And so we pull over at a, at a, uh, McDonald's and, uh, for, for dinner. And so we're standing there in the line and I'm talking to Augustine. I'm saying, man, I got to meet this Paul Kane. And when I said that, the guy in front of me, standing in front of me, turned around. His name was Reed Grafke. He turns around. He goes, I work for Paul Kane. We're at the California. Phoenix, I mean, Arizona state line, McDonald's. And, and Augustine says, no, no way. No way. He goes, I, I work for Paul Kane. Me and Augustine have been talking about him for two hours or however many. We're staring. We are speechless. I'm not speechless very often. I was speechless. Reed gave me his card. He said, give him a call. He's just really waiting on the Lord. He's at a very, very strategic time. We drive on. The Lord literally tells me, do not call Paul Cain. I am, in, I am pained about this. I tear the card up and I throw it away. It's 84, 85, 86, 87. March 87. Bob Jones comes. He says, I've had a dream from the Lord. The Lord wants to increase the prophetic. 
but he's not going to increase the prophetic around this place. He goes, you guys are so dependent upon me and Augustine and a few others. You're so dependent. The Lord says he wants you to seek him. There's a seeking of the Lord that's related to the prophetic. You're so lazy. You guys are, I mean, we're doing our prayer meetings, but we're just taking the prophetic for granted. He says, you're lazy about it. And the Lord wants your spiritual muscle strength. And he wants you to actually seek him. And when you seek him, he will give you more and it will establish your spiritual muscles. So uh, a couple steps later, not just from Bob's word, but uh, five or six of us all received the same word at the same time. 20 of us or 30 of us in the leadership team, we went on a 21-day water fast. All of them said, we're all going to do a water fast together, all like 25 or 30. We all committed, and we're going to spend six, seven, eight, whatever hours every day. We took this word serious because the Lord spoke it to four or five other guys, and we locked in for these 21 days in March to ask God for the prophetic and to pray for different, for the breaking through the power of God and healing on, on individuals in the congregation as well, but for the administration of the anointing to be released in a greater way. But the prophetic was very, very clearly the thing that was the catalytic point. The fast ends very much like this fast. Ends on Thursday night, and uh, I and a whole team of us are in St. Louis on Friday, the day after. Well, it was literally the day after, and there's always little surprises the day after. I always know that, good surprises. And so uh, I'm in Birmingham, and I'm lamenting. I mean, I love, I'm love. i loving going to St. Louis. I'm lamenting it's the day after because it's just like it's not the seemingly the right time, but it just always ends up right when it's all over. But I'm lamenting because it was a, f- a commitment months ago, and I didn't know about the fast, and here it is the next day. And, oh, man, everyone's, a bunch of us go. It's this little uh, gathering, this little church in Birmingham, Alabama. And there's this elderly man sitting on the back row. And I go back to him. And I said, hi, how are you doing? I said, uh, my name is Michael. What's your name? He says, he goes, oh, uh, uh, my name is Paul Kane." And I looked at him. I go, excuse me? He says, uh, oh, I'm uh, uh, Paul Kane." Uh, I go, who do you know here? He says, well, just one guy. He goes, the Lord told me to come. He goes, I, I uh, really don't know anybody. He goes, well, good to meet you. And I go, Paul King, are, are you a prophet? He goes, well, uh, some people say I am. I think the Lord says I am. Yeah, I think. And he was being all that, you know, I'm looking at him. I go, you are Paul Kane, the prophet, right? He goes, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I'm staring at him. And he says, uh, well, anyway, I got to speed this story up or I'm never going to get done. So. No, no, no. I got so many important stories to tell. Shh, shh, shh. Believe me, I got a lot of very important stories to tell. And uh, but you're going to be glad you heard if I, don't, if I, if I get to them. Okay, so we, that's the night where we go to the restaurant where he, he gets tired and says, can we move to another table because I'm tired. Because he t- says, you know, the lady's got the kidneys and the guy, da-da-da, the other guy, da-da-da. And, and I found out in a, that it was true. And uh, me and Paul were so joined together. The Lord joined us, and we talked about that in such a, a powerful way, and it's never thing, anything that's, anyway, it's stayed true ever since. It was an instant joining in the Spirit. He came to Kansas City uh, the next month in May, spent 10 days, and then when he came here, he saw the Joel's Army in training. He says, the first time I've ever seen it on a building, ever. Just in time for the John Wimber. Just in time for the John Wimber thing. Okay, now we're going to talk about uh, connection with the John Wimber, because here's what the John Wimber connection is. Very, very critical. Very, very critical. Because it's the joining of prophetic and intercession with worship and compassion. And the Lord was insistent about those four things coming together. And I have to stress that. The Lord, men may not be insistent, but God is insistent those four things are together. Compassion means healing. It's, 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 a, it's a way to healing that flows through the tenderness of God's compassion. And worship means intimacy. Worship has ever, a lot of, to more than intimacy, but it's based in intimacy. Bob Jones first, uh, he, he uh, came to me. The story, go, we got to back up a little bit. January 1984. 1984. Okay. Uh, 1984. Uh, Bob Jones, we're talking. He says, I have seen it. He goes, I've seen, he goes, God, because the day I met him, he said, this movement, it's a worldwide movement. You know, he's always, he always told me that from the day I met him. He goes, you're going to connect with another worldwide movement. He goes, this movement's called uh, prophetic and intercession. That movement is called uh, compassion and worship, compassion and worship. 
And he said, this movement is based 35 miles southeast of L.A. He says, their message is the elementary, the elementary things of the kingdom of God. I don't know what he's talking about. It means healing. It means more than healing. And he said, uh, gave me a negative uh, issue in their leadership. Their leadership. Said, their leadership has A, B, and C in it, of which John Wimber has said publicly many times, those A, B, and Cs, but I don't want to go, go there. And uh, he said, you're going to cross pollinate cross-pollinate with this movement and God wants the four realities to come together in fullness and that's why you're cross-pollinating he wants and I, I set my heart I believed it now the vineyard movement they haven't had to my knowledge their first conference at least maybe they've had little ones but not their first big one their first big one wasn't for six months I never heard of the vineyard Bob Jones never heard of the vineyard I've never heard of anybody who ever heard of the vineyard in January 84 and uh I mean, they, they were doing, you know, they, the Lord had not set them out there yet. So now it's June 84, and a, a guy a friend from Canada sends me this thing, Signs and Wonders. He goes, hey, you know, you like John G. Lake, and you like healing. You want to go? This guy, their healings are, like, going wild. I mean, they're everywhere. I go, really? Yeah, I'll go. If there's healings everywhere, i got to learn about this healing, you know, because it's because I, I had all the, we had these prophecies from the Solemn Assembly a year earlier about healings, and I said, i got to learn about this stuff. And so I went to the conference, and I'm there, and John Wimber, in one of his sessions, his, actually, it's his opening session, or the first one I was at, let's put it that way, it was the opening session. He's up at the front, he goes, well, he goes, people are talking about healing, but he goes, if you really want to know who we are, he goes, the thing I'm really motivated by, or, or something like this, he goes, is compassion. He goes, com the compassion of God's heart, and he goes, and, and the, really, the other thing that really touches me is worship. And that struck me. I went at the break, I said, how far is L.A. from here, and the guy said, ah, about 35, 40 miles southeast of L.A., and that's what Bob Jones said, a movement, 35 miles southeast of L.A. that has compassion and worship, the elementary things of the kingdom of God, and they have these a few negative things in their leadership. I said, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Go back home, tell Bob Jones. He says, well, you never know. You Sometimes you think it's one thing and it's the other. Bob prays about it, and the Lord says, this is that. 84 goes by, 85, 86, 87. Now, remember, Paul Kane, we just connected in spring of 87. So I've known Paul Kane six months, and now it's October 87. And uh, uh, John uh, Wimber and I, we don't have a relationship or anything. And I was at five or six or seven or eight. I mean, I went to a lot of the conferences and just soaked it up. It's October 87. I've known Paul Kane now six months. We're really close friends. Bob Jones calls me on the phone. Oh, no, actually tells it at a, lead, at a little staff meeting, about 10 of us. He goes, I heard the audible voice of the Lord again. He says, you know that that compassion and worship, healing, I mean, compassion, worship, cross-pollinization that's going to happen with you guys, prophetic intercession? He goes, you've been waiting on that for years? He goes, yeah. He says, the Lord says it's going to begin January 88. The Lord's going to put his hand on John Wimber. John Wimber's going to call you. He's going to connect with you in January 88. Thus says the Lord. Because it's been 84, 85, 86. I go, well, I don't really think John Wimber thinks a whole lot about, even knows anything about, whatever, whatever, whatever. January 88, I'm at home on a Saturday night. The phone rings. Hello? Hello? Uh, Mike Bickle, this is John Wimber. I am from Anaheim. And he went on to describe his ministry. And uh, I says, John, I've been to five or ten of your conferences, whatever it was. And he says, well, he goes, i got an unusual request. He goes, uh, a man named Jack Deere, who's a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, gave me a tape of yours, and I heard it today, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, invite him. He goes, uh, I said, wow. And I'm thinking, unbelievable. Here it is, January 88. I'm on the phone. He said, here's the deal. He goes, I have my whole staff. There's about 100 to 150, about 150 on the staff. He goes, we got a retreat, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. He goes, we have a three-hour morning, three-hour afternoon, three-hour evening session. So we have nine three-hour sessions for three days. The Holy Spirit told me to give you all nine of them. He goes, can you come Tuesday? I know it's Saturday night. And uh, I said, it ends up, yes. And he was very uh, polite about it. says, if you can't understand, I go, no, no. And uh, and uh, look forward to get it, getting to know you. So I go there. We do the nine sessions, three days. That Me and John are so connected, so powerfully at the end of the of the nine of the three days, nine long sessions, <clears throat> and me and John are having 
the dinners in between and staying up late afterwards. Through not all of them, but through most of them. And so we are really connected. And I'm aware of what's going on. I, obviously, I'm not telling him the story. I don't tell him the stories for two or three years. Because I, did, I didn't want in any ways uh, for, for the story to in any way direct what was going to happen. Because it didn't need it. It was already being directed by something far more powerful than stories. By God. And so uh, John says, Mike, I feel this and this. And I said, me too. And we knew the Lord put us together. So now, January goes by, February, March, April, May, June. Six months, nearly. Bob Jones comes to me. It's June 5th. I can remember it vividly. He comes to me. He goes, hey, have you heard from John Wimber? I go, no. He goes, well, you wasn't supposed to. He goes, the Lord didn't want to. He says, uh, timing's now. He goes, I heard from the Lord again. He goes, I, again. It was, I heard it out loud. I heard his voice. He said, Wimber's calling you again this week. He goes, did he call you last time? Exactly when the Lord said. I go, he sure did. You said in October 87, he'll call in January 88. And he called. He goes, well, the same thing's true. Here's what's going to happen. John's going to open three wide doors, number one. Number two, he says uh, uh, he's going to open three wide doors. That's the first thing that's going to happen. He says, uh, number two, he goes, you got to know, uh, he says, the vineyard, he says, uh, the Lord told me this. They have 50,000 people in America and about a million worldwide. That's, that's the scope. I said, that's kind of neat. That's an interesting thing for like an angel or however it happened to tell you. He goes, well, it's, he did. And I, and I thought I should tell you. I go, okay. He said, it's only going to last three years, a period of three years, this period, particular period. I said, man, this is exciting. He goes, no, that's the bad news. He goes, that's the bad news, what I want to tell you. He goes, this is a warning, not a promise. I said, a warning, not a promise. I go, how could that be possible? I said, I, I love John Wimber. He goes, no, I don't mean because of John Wimber. Just, he said, uh, here's what the Lord told me. He said, uh, uh, he was quoting a verse out of the life of, of David. He said, uh, but he was applying, David, it was wonderful. He was applying to me negatively. He says, you don't know how to come in and go out before the Lord or before the people in front of a million people. I go, what does that mean? He said, well, he goes, you think a million people is exciting. He goes, and by the way, the Lord told me, because I'm talking about Kansas City right now. He said, the Lord told me to tell you, you're going to be trained in a Holy Spirit seminary of, with a million people watching. And he says, and the Lord's going to put zeros on this when the real one begins. This is the training time only. And he said, you don't know how to go in and go out before the Lord. And you don't know how to go in and go out before the people with a million people. In a glass house. I said, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. He says, well, he says, when a million people come, you're going to lose your way. Your heart isn't going to stay connected. He says, you're going to have more fires burning of jealous, stirred up people. Your good friends, your old friends, your new enemies, your old enemies. Oh, my God goodness will you stir up not you but this will stir up so many feelings under the surface that are negative and you don't have a clue about it and john wimber understands a lot about this stuff but the lord's going to train you because your day is not for years down the road so i go well whatever i mean what a weird word i mean in reality i i go i was kind of excited about this word well i went i went for the good part of the word John Wimber calls a day or two later. Hello, Mike. John, he goes, I really apologize. I haven't talked to you. I go, John, it was perfect godly God's will, I'm, I'm sure. He goes, well, you're awful gracious. He, of course, I had a little help because Bob told me that. And uh, he said, hey, I got three things. Bob said, the Lord, John's going to open three wide doors. I said, yes, yes, yes. He goes, boy, you're easy. And I said, I'm not always that easy. <laughs> And later we would laugh about that because he remembered it. I remembered it. I told him the whole thing about a year or maybe a year or two later. It was some time later. I said, John, I'm really curious. Just It just matters to me. I go, how many people are in the vineyard? He goes, well, they say. He goes, I think about 50,000 in America. Huh. I go, how many worldwide? He goes, how do I know? He goes, they say about a million. I said, I think those numbers are right. He says, why, why would you ask and why would you say that? I said, I just think they're right numbers. Because they were exactly what Bob told me. John says, okay, I want you to go with me. He gave me these three things to do. And so I said, yes. So the, uh, uh, one of the, of the three was uh, to go with him to Scotland, November 1988. To go to Scotland. 
So it's a few months later. I'm in Scotland with him. And he says, now here's what the Lord wants us to do. He goes, I'm going to do the sessions. And then I'm going to spend, we're going to do every, every meal and every afterwards together. And I want you to tell me, and you can, those of you that know John Wimber, Gary, you can picture it. He's looking forward. He goes, everything, everything. <laughs> and I said, everything. He goes, my friend Jack Deere at Dallas Theological Seminary tells me you know a whole lot of stories about strange things. <laughs> Gary, can you picture John Deere? And he goes, I want to hear everything. And I says, no, you don't. <laughs> Not really. Because I, I don't even like everything that I believe. I didn't tell that to him. That's what I'm thinking. So we start. I'm talking to Paul Kane every day on the phone. We start. And I mean, I give him the eight-hour version of which you've had 11 hours of it. He got the eight-hour version in about a day or two. He loved it. He'd say, oh. Got to go. We got to go do a session, but we'll come right back. He says, I'll turn the ministry time over to some of the people. I'll get it started. I want to hear. Don't forget where you're at. I go, oh, I won't forget. I won't forget. I know these stories well. We come back and we would take off and we go late in the night and it went on. So I called Paul Kane. Paul said, tell him all the stories again. He can't remember hardly anything you've said. I said, well, he seems pretty live because he can't remember anything. So I, I said, okay. So, I, the, uh, you know, we're going. He goes, you got more stories? I go, yeah. So I, I retold the stories. And he goes, wow. And it was the same story I told. I went, oh. He goes, man, how did you feel when that happened? So we went through it again. I called Paul Kane a couple days later. He said, tell him all again. He's got about half of it. I did. I told it. He goes, oh, yeah, I remember that. But he goes, wow. And, and, and so I knew. So the Lord was guiding this. He cared about it. He cared about it. So now we had just, uh, I just have come from a staff meeting in Kansas City on my way to Scotland. And Paul Kane had been here for about a week or so. And uh, we were out. And, it, and the weather was okay. It wasn't uh, 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 cold in any big way. And uh, he said, uh, you know, at the staff meeting next week, he goes, uh, the snows are going to come. And I said, well, I think we're just a little, maybe a couple weeks early from the snow. He goes, no, no, the snows are coming. He gave me the day. He goes, they're going to come, and, uh, and they're going to be white. It's gonna, everything's going to be covered in white. And, uh, and it's going to be a, a little token because I'm going to address the staff about some attitudes. And the Lord's, and there's going to be repentance. It's going to be supernatural. You wait and see. Because there's some hidden attitudes. I'm going to address the staff. And the Lord's going to make the staff as white as snow. And when you leave the staff meeting, it's going to be white outside, not before you come in. I said, well, Paul, it's a, it's, I don't think it's going to be quite cold enough. Well, a couple of days went by. The weather changed dramatically or whatever. It changed enough. We go in. No snow. We get in the staff meeting. I look at Paul, I wink at him, he winks at me, he gives this intense, fiery message, eight or ten of the people on the staff confessed attitudes, a couple of guys were weeping that they had done this and that, I thought, my goodness, it was the only time we ever had a gathering that happened like that, we went outside our car, the thing went long, there's snow everywhere, I'm walking Paul in the car, he says, the Lord told you, told me to tell you he would make the staff as white as snow, look at it, he goes, there's unity everywhere, he goes, this kind of thing is going to happen all the time. So I'm fresh off of that story, and I'm telling that to John Wimber, and I'm telling the comet, the, the, the drought. And so John Wimber says, of course, uh, I'm talking to Paul Kane, and John Wimber's talking to Jack Deere, because he's the one that kind of set him up with us. So we're both having our little private little talks after our late meetings with each other. And so uh, John asked me, he goes, well, our... We decided, he goes, can I meet this guy? I go, yeah, I, when, when, when do you get home? He goes, well, you know, when I get home, you know, you know, like the 1st of December, like, like in a couple of days, whatever. That's within the whole time. We went a couple of places. And so uh, I said, well, he'll come right now. I called to ask Paul, will you come? Yeah, and, and Jack Deere asked Paul, because Jack Deere is talking to Paul, <laughs> you know, because they were starting a new friendship. And uh, so uh, J John says, well, okay, he's coming. He goes, he's just going to come? He goes, is that it? Like a prophet just comes? Is that all they do? I mean, what, what do they wear? What do they do? I go, it's not like that. They just come. He goes, hi, how you doing, Paul? He goes, no way. He goes, it's got to be different than that. And I said, you never know. He goes, will there be a sign? And so I, I asked Paul. And Jack Deere's asking him from, a, uh, you know, from America in. And Paul says, yeah, there's going to be a sign. And uh the long and short of it is, he tells uh, John, he says, here's the sign. He tells it through Jack and then through myself. He says, here's the sign. He says, uh, there's going to be, the day I come, there's going to be a token. The Lord's going to give it to you. He goes, there's going to be an earthquake the day that I visit. 
and there's going to be an earthquake the day that I leave. And John says, well, I don't even know which day you're coming. And, ja- and Paul Cain said, you pick the day. He says, I picked the day and there's an earthquake. And Jack said, is this the big earthquake? And he meant the big California one. And Paul said, no, not the day I come. It's not the big one, but it will be in California, but it won't be the big one. But there will be a big one the day I leave. And John can pick the days. And he said, uh, and tell John, here's my message. My message is Jeremiah 33, 8. You know what Bob Jones talked about? Uh, he said there, compassion, interse- I mean, worship and the elementary things of the kingdom, which meant healing, plus some. And uh, they had some issues in their leadership. Well, Paul Cain picked up on that as well. And Jeremiah 33, 8 was the message Paul Cain announced ahead of time to Jack and to myself. He says, God's going to give him a season of mercy and forgive him every, forgive all the sins of the leadership, all of them. It's a season of mercy if they'll take it. Jeremiah 33, 8. Good. So, December 3rd shows up, and that's the day. December 3rd, Paul's coming in. He flies in that day. John already knows it's Jeremiah 33, 8. He's all relieved because he knows there's some things out of order with a few guys. And so this prophet who scares him is going to come and, and he's going to be relaxed. But here's the point. The earthquake hits Southern California, actually in Pasadena, right next to Anaheim. It hits at 338 in the morning. Exactly the passage that's already been given. So John Weber calls me on the phone. He goes, maybe it's four in the afternoon or one or two or something in the afternoon. He goes, unbelievable did you hear about the earthquake i go no but i believed it would probably come he goes mike it he had the word jeremiah 338 it happened 338 in the morning what what, am i saying it wrong isn't that what i'm saying i'm trying to say jeremiah 338 okay that's what i'm I'm not saying it right okay thank you jeremiah 338 is what i'm trying to say okay and it happened at 338 a.m Good. That's clear in my mind. I don't know if I'm getting it clear to you. <laughs> but uh, So John says, it happened at 3.38 a.m., and it's the word. Of course, I knew the word. Jack knew the word. He goes, and I knew the word ahead of time. He goes, I am scared to death. I haven't met the guy yet. He goes, what do I do? And, and this is funny. J- John says, he's like, he's coming in an hour. It's too late to fast. <laughs> and I made a little joke to John. I said, hey, an hour is better than nothing. <laughs> I said, I'd go for the hour. I mean, what? why not an hour? I would. <laughs> so we, we joked about that for a while. So Paul King comes in, and, and they have an incredible time. And then uh, J- uh, Paul, Paul Kane leaves December 7th. And the day he leaves, the big earthquake hits in Soviet Armenia where 50,000 or something like that, some number, even a little larger than that, died. It was one of the biggest earthquakes, you know, in however many years around the world. And it, and it was staggering to all of us. And Paul told me, he said, this is why, I said, why earthquakes? He goes, because when compassion and worship merges with con- prophetic and intercession, there will be an earthquake felt the whole world through when these things come together. And uh, that's not a future thing. That happened. That happened. He said an earthquake is about to take place. He goes, the reason there was a local one, this earthquake of the merging of these four realities will shake the entire vineyard system locally in California. And it happened. It shook them. Meaning leaders said, I don't like it. Other leaders said, I love it. And there was all kinds of happy, mad, glad, and sad people locally. And many, many, many more internationally. Because of the coming together. And that's too big of a story. But Paul said that. He goes, an earthquake is going to hit. But the Lord is really serious about it. Let me just kind of fast forward. When those things, four things come together with passion and anointing, there will be another earthquake that will go around the world. Meaning, what I mean by earthquake, I'm talking about people, many glad, many sad, and many mad. That's what I mean by earthquakes. I'm talking about all kinds of collisions of people in their and their uh, ministry systems and institutions, all kinds of things crack and break, and they did. Because uh, the, the combination of those four things, nobody can control it but the Lord. Nobody can. And that's a, a thing i got a lot of feeling about and a lot of, to say, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to go there. So I traveled with John for about three years with Paul and John, and I'm really aware, Bob Jones tells me all the time, he goes, you know, you're just in seminary. This is all about that young, that youth movement that's coming some years down the road. He goes, remember, you're in seminary right now. 
take notes. And I tell you, not that I took them perfectly, but I took them diligently. John told me about uh, international ministry, because that's what Bob said he's going to teach about international ministry, diplomacy. He taught me about structures and people. He did a lot of things right. He did a lot of things wrong by his own confession. You know, I, I'm not a perfect learner, but I was observing, 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 saying, Lord, teach me. Many times I said, Lord, show me, show me, show me. I can't remember all this. There's too many things happening right now. Many, many things happen. Of which uh, what happened was a great uh, controversy broke out. A great controversy broke out. And uh, this controversy ended up writing. There was probably six or seven books written of which... The combination of what we were doing here or what they were doing there related to us, some combination was featured as a primary part of six or seven books that went out warning people about us being demonic and one of the most dangerous cults in the world. Six or seven books went out around the nation. A number of them were inter internationally sold in markets everywhere. Probably 25 different Christian magazines, a bunch through England, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Singapore, well, just all kinds of places, wrote the story. They put it on the front, front cover, many of them. Kansas City controversy, all kinds of forces collide, and many ministries rose up and said, John Wimber has introduced heretics to the world. Others rose up and said, John Wimber has done the wisest thing. Others people said, well, I'm leaving John Wimber because he have this, and others said, if he, they do the Kansas City beer off the wall because of the vineyard, it was everywhere. Gary, was it everywhere? It was everywhere, all over the world. And there was an earthquake brewing, not brewing, breaking forth, and lots, I mean, so many of the Christian magazines around the world were putting it as their cover stories. And, and, and uh, I had just to have a whole stack of magazines on it. And the bizarre things, po real positive and real negative and real, you know, just playing, you know, the, the lawyer role and whatever. And Bob Jones said, I told you all this was going to happen. He said, this was a warning, not a promise. And locally, the stress on our team, the stress in the city, the stress in the vineyard in the nation, the stress in John Wimber's ministry in the world, all of the stress of all the ministries were just colliding with each other because a lot of real, real big ministries, as big as John Wimber, endorsed John 100%, and so now they had to answer for us. And some did one way and some did the other way. <laughs> it just went in all kinds of places. Okay, so... I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but there was a day, I remember, we had gone so many conferences, so many, two and three, sometimes four and five a month, and all over the world, and it was such a time of learning, and I remember I was in uh, Denver, Denver, Colorado, at Tom Stive at a conference at his church, and I was looking in the parking lot, I said, John, I remember we were in a van, just the two of us, I said, John, he says, something wrong? I go, yes. He goes, did I do it? I go, no, no. I said, I'm backslidden. He goes, he laughed. He goes, what do you mean? I go, no, I'm backslidden, John. I'm not joking. He goes, I mean, you got something to tell me? I go, no, no, nothing like that. I said, for years, I would pray and my heart moved and I had tears. I, I said, I... For a number of years, I could open the word, not every day, but many, many days, and weep with tenderness and love. I opened the word, nothing. I said, I preach, it's got a little energy on it, but when it's me and God, and it's not God anointing me for the sake of others, it's me and him, I'm cold. I, I can't live this way. I said, the Lord told me in Matthew 25, the verse where it says, go get the oil. Verse 8, go acquire oil. I said, John, I have to go home. I have to go home. I said, until my heart moves again, I'm going home. He says, well, we got four or five more conferences. I said, I'll go if you tell me because my word's my word. He says, no, no, I release you right now. He goes, there. He goes I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I came home and told the guys. I said, I'm, I'm canceling out all the, the four or five or whatever, how many more I had. And I said, I get oil in my lamp. My heart doesn't move. I'm going to sit in the prayer room. I don't want a bunch of meetings here with the staff. I just, if I, my heart doesn't start moving again, I am finished because I am ministering on yesterday's manna. I'm living on borrowed oil, and I'm not going to do this anymore. I don't care how big the crowds are. I do not care. I am not first a preacher. I am first a worshiper and a lover, and my oil is, if it's not gone, it's on the last ounce. I'm living on fumes right now. So I came home, and I remember that was June uh, June uh, ninety one, 
And I was telling the story to a few uh, guys there. They go, how come you canceled out? You know, and I said, well, and how did you even get to know Bob, uh, uh, John Wimber? And I was telling the story. Well, in, the, in June 88, Bob Jones told me, and he said it would only be three years. And, and I stopped. It was months later. And I just took a step back, and I went, that was exactly three years. And now I was a part of the vineyard and part of the family and part of the minute and part of the organization, but not in any, I didn't travel with John anymore and I just stayed home. And I went, oh my goodness, there were so many, I said, I said, it was true. I went to Bob. I told Bob this. I said, Bob, it's true. It's true. I could not minister in front of a million people. And, uh, I did not know how to come in and go out before God or the people, meaning before God, I lost my oil. And Bob said, I told you you would. I said, I lost my oil. And before the people, there are so many snares and traps and so many levels of agendas worldwide, locally, in our, our own church, everywhere. There's snares and traps. This is like, he said, you're like a, a, a lamb before wolves. You have no idea how to move in and out before all of that intrigue. I mean, all of that, uh, all of those levels of agendas. He goes, you're not wise enough. You were not supposed to be. This was a training time in the spirit. And I said, I don't like it out there. Do you think you're going to go on some platform? If you think you're going to go stand on some platform in some big nation with 20,000 people and all of a sudden 10,000 leaders in that area are just going to think you're awesome, you are in total unreality. If you're on a platform of 20,000 people, you can be sure there's 10,000 leaders in that nation and you can be sure a lot of them think you're off the wall and they don't know anything of it except for rumors about you. That's how life works under the sun. That's how it works. And so some people get these ideas they are going to go around the world and, and again, again, get rich and famous. Man, you're going to have a bullseye, the thorn of the flesh, the devil's coming. And what the devil doesn't do, the ministries will do to you. And if what the ministries don't do to it, the people that you're working with that are under you living in the fruit of your decisions, they will do it to you. It's everywhere. My point is this. That sounds all cynical and mean. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying this. At the end of the day, if you end up, and a number of you will have it in large ministries, some of you will. You will have all kinds of hiccups and bruises and tripwires at every level, close and far away. And if you're doing it for any other reason besides oil and God, you will have a hundred reasons to quit. That's why most ministries of international ministries are bitter, cynical. They minister with a professional spirit, though they have an anointing on them on the platform. That's for the sake of the people, God's heart for the people. In private, their hearts are bitter angry and they live spiritually bored and i got to meet many many ministries and my impact after I, my impression when i left i said i have never seen so much chronic boredom of the chief leaders around many nations on the platform they're anointed and that anointing is for the people what they do in private they have it, it was shocking it was Rude awakening. It is so different than being 20 years old thinking you're going to touch nations and it's going to just go perfectly. It's not. It's not. The Lord wants you to know how to come in and go out before him and how to do it before people. And the Lord told Bob Jones way back there in that day and he said, the Lord's going to put zeros on that, those numbers. He's going to put zeros on those numbers. He goes, Mike, you have no idea where this is going and the pressure this is going to create. Not just for you, for many, many, many who are in the circle with you. You will have pressures you cannot fathom when the Lord puts zeros on the numbers he gave John Wimber. John Wimber was a mentor. I've called him a father. I think it's more accurate to call him a mentor. He was really a mentor. A man that uh, uh, I love very, very dearly. He went to be with the Lord some years ago, and I have incredible esteem and respect and affection for him. Well, going on to Kansas City. What about Kansas City? Let, let, let me just give you a few. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Like I've done a few times. August 8th, 1975, an angel appears to Bob Jones. I've, I've referenced this many times. It says Kansas City is going to be one of the revival centers for the whole world. In essence, that, that's the meaning of it, not a direct quote. May 7th, 1983, the comet comes, and the message that Gabriel, Daniel 9, God's going to raise up in Kansas City. In essence, I'm going to say it the same way every time, a revival center for the whole world. November 15th, Howard Pittman's in heaven. He has his heavenly experience, November 15th, 83, and, and it all ends up when the story is all put together, and it comes out, God says there's a little Gideon group meeting May 7th, 1983. There's a sign in the heavens, go tell them, I'm about to visit them and touch the whole world. 
That's what he tells me. Something real close to that. May 1985, Bob Jones comes and says, God's going to show the World Series, the whole world is going to turn their eyes on Kansas City and the, and things happening in the Midwest, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, and whatever. I gave a little bit of that story. May 1989, Paul Keynes at 700 Club. May 89. He's right there on the air. I don't see it, but I, a half dozen people tell me. Paul Keynes telling his story or telling something, and right in the middle of it, a, a spirit of prophecy comes on him. And he says, God's about to put Kansas City on the map. And afterwards, he came right from 700 Club to here. And I said, Paul, did you say that? He goes, yeah, I did. He goes, I said, why? He goes, man, it just came on me. He goes, it had nothing to do with what I was talking about. He said, I think the Lord just wanted to document it, I guess. I don't know. He goes, I just threw it in there. I never heard it. Oh, I had Paul that day. I mean, why did I need to go watch the 700 Club? He was right there. He told me himself. <laughs> Couple uh, On that very trip, that very trip, uh, he's staying in the Residence Inn over in Overland Park. And don't go stay there and hope you get a visitation. It doesn't work this way. Some people are so goofy about that stuff, you know. They want to touch, you know, a prophet's shoes or something. Just forget all that. Touch the hem of the other prophet's garment and you'll be just fine. But remember, you've got to get down real low to touch the hem of that prophet. Yea, more than a prophet. God himself, Jesus. Okay, he's at residence in, and an angel, he sees an angel. Paul's only seen an angel, uh, you know, a small number of times in his life. Compared to all the words he gets, you'd think he would see angels every day. Bob has seen angels a couple more times than Paul, but both numbers are actually small when you think of 50 years, you know, or in the 50-year plan. But uh, this angel only appears to him for 5 to 10 seconds. It's, he says a very, very short thing. He goes, he's standing in the hallway, right in the doorway. He says, he's, look, he's looking at me. He goes, our eyes locked in. He says, our eyes locked. He goes, my being trembled right through me. And the angel told me, he says, the prophetic strategies touching nations will be discussed at the round table in Kansas City. Paul's visiting. He lives in Dallas at that time. The angel looks at him. He says, the prophetic strategy touching nations will be discussed at the round table in Kansas City. So the angel tells him. And then he says, I'm, the Lord's going to raise up Kansas City as a revival center for the whole world. He tells him that. He tells him these two sentences. Paul comes. I see him later that day. I go over there, and he goes, he was trembling. I said, Paul, are you okay? And he goes, no, I'm not okay. He goes, I am terrified. I'm not even ready to tell you right now what happened to me. I says, I mean, is it good or bad? Is it, is it your heart, or is it like God? I mean, you tip me off a little bit. What's happening? He says, I've had a visitation from the Lord I can't even bear to say right now. Well, eventually he told me. And he says, Mike, God is going to establish prophetic strategies touching all the, na not all the nations, but many nations of the earth right here in the, in the round table. That, that, that was May 89. It was in August 2000 he t when he's walking up and down Shiloh when the Lord says to him behind him, and he says, what's it to you if I make Kansas City a revival center that touches the whole world? And what's it to you if I give Mike Bickle a billion dollars? He says that, those two questions to him. And Paul said, I mean, technically, the Lord didn't say he was going to do it right then. But he goes, I have reason to believe he meant he's going to. I said, I'm taking it. So, it's May 98, and Paul's shaking. He's trembling under this word from an angel. God's going to make raise up Kansas City as a, a revival center for the to touch the whole world. So now, it's May, June, July, September, October. October 89, he comes, he goes, hey. He says, the Lord, uh, he, uh, he kind of uh, added a little bit more to that word. He added a little bit more to it. He said he's going to uh, put Kansas City on the map around the world by intrigue. I said, intrigue? He goes, I know. That's strange. Isn't that strange? He said, by intrigue. I go, what does that mean? He goes, I don't know what it, I mean, he knows what intrigue means, but he says, I don't know what that means. He says, we're going to take a lap around the globe by intrigue. There's going to be a season. We're going to get healed up. We're going to get anointed. We're going to get a fresh impartation. Then we're going to take a trip around the globe by substance. But the first trip around the globe will be intrigue. I said, how long between the two? He goes, I, I don't know. I hope short for my sake. I'm thinking of himself. He goes, you got a lot. He goes, you got a lot of years. Don't worry about it. I said, yeah, but I'm kind of, you know. I don't want to do the intrigue thing. I want to do the substance thing. He said, there'll be a season where the substance will come. Then, it's uh, uh, 1990, a few months later, because that was October 89, 1990. That's when the forces all hit. Now, here's what happened in 19, December and January of 1990. It was, I mean, December 89 and 1990. These forces hit so oddly. 
John Wimber has a, a magazine that goes across the whole uh, 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 Western world. It's the Vineyard Magazine. He, the edition of the, you know, that comes out, it's getting to everybody in December and then Christmas, so they'll read it in January. It is it's called Introducing the Prophetic Ministry, and it's highlighting Kansas City, Paul Kane, Mike Bickle, and he's telling the stories. That goes out. Same time, a, a an Anglican bishop writes a book called "Some Th- Said It Thundered." He it comes out time, and it becomes an international bestseller. And he had come here, and he was telling the story of his encounter in Kansas City. It becomes an international bestseller at the same time. At the same time, two uh, I won't uh, I won't name them because I just don't like to. Two uh, ministries, uh, one in England, one in America, went real heavy on saying we were of the devil and of the occult. And John Wimber was introducing a cult heresy, uh, one with a real big ministry in England and one that got the word out across the whole world. I mean, not the whole world, but all over and said, they're of the devil. We have evidence of the devil. We're sure. And, uh, uh, and, uh, John Wimber, uh, the guys around the world were saying he's entered, he's deceived. And the Anglican bishop is deceived. This international bestseller is all a hoax. And then, uh, it was on. And so it took, you know, T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, it took a month or two to get through all the ranks all around the world. And it was the wildest two to three year run that you could imagine. Like I said, six or seven books are written. Uh, we were not the only feature of the book negatively, but one of the main features, if not the main feature, several books, we were the feature. And uh, uh, other books wrote, uh, rose to defend us, but it was just everywhere. Then the Anglican, the Anglican, uh, world, you know, the, you know, wherever the British Empire, uh, they have 56 million people who have, get this magazine, or, uh, uh, I'm sure everybody reads it, but, and so they, they decide to look into the matter, and they say, there's this big headlines, Kansas City prophets, or prophets are okay, says Anglican Church, and it goes to all the nations where the British Empire, front page, there it is. The Anglican news, the world newspaper, whatever they call it. And there's the whole, the story of Kansas City. <laughs> and so this man comes to me from South Africa. He said, I just came from South Africa. He goes, and all the, there's a, I was with the, the main ministries. I mean, the mega churches. And they're all talking about Kansas City. He goes, this is so intriguing. And when he said it, I said, that is exactly the word. He goes, how did this happen? I said, the Lord wanted it to happen. He wanted it to take place. And so, uh, some years come, but come and go. Transition time. Transition time. Got a couple more minutes. It's, it's, uh, January, it's summer 1993. Summer, I'm in the vineyard. I've, I, I came home after 91 just to get oil in my lamp, and I love it. And that's what that, that years of going deeper is all about. You know, have, I have it here, uh, going deeper. What, what years I have written down here? Uh, 93 to 95. That's the getting oil in the lamp years. That's, or bringing all the truths together, really. And, but, and, but sitting a lot of hours before the Lord. So, uh, 1993, I have a very powerful prophetic dream. I'm at home. I love it. Oh, that was a wild ride. <laughs> Things are at peace. All the controversies have settled down. We've made peace with a number of those that we are at odds with. And all kinds of good things are happening. I have this dream. The controversy, it's, it's gone out in many magazines. It is over. A lot of people decided we're, we're all friends. I mean, there were about five guys internationally and about five guys locally. So it's all different sets of people. Even all the guys locally were not connected to each other. About five nationally and about five locally that were stirred up. And they, some of them met each other in the process, and some never did. And it all just settled down. It just all kind of went away. And uh, it's 93, and things are at peace everywhere, and I have this dream. And in this dream, I'm on this platform with this vast auditorium with Benny Hinn. With Benny Hinn. And in this dream, I know that I'm in transition. And so after this dream, very, very powerful. I, I get the whole staff together. I go, I had the wildest dream. There's a transition time coming. It doesn't happen until 96. This is 93. And I tell the dream for a number of years, maybe three, four, five times, maybe five times at key staff meetings. I go, there's this dream. I'm on this large platform and Benny Hinn and da-da-da-da. And, and they said, well, do you know Benny Hinn? I go, no. They said, well, there's not much chance you're going to be on that platform. I go, I don't, I'm not going to do nothing. I didn't call John Wimber. I didn't call John, Paul Kane. I didn't call Bob Jones. I didn't call anybody. I'm not going to do nothing. 
I'm going to do what I do best. That's really what fasting is. I'm just going to do nothing. So I'm just saying that's a good excuse to not answer the phone. But anyway, <coughs> I'm fasting. So now it's, it's, uh, it's uh, October 96. I go to Toronto. Uh, uh, John Arnott says, hey, come to a conference up here. Good. October 96, I'm up in Toronto doing a conference. And they got about maybe, I mean, a good conference, five or 8,000 people, a lot of number of people there. And this guy comes over and says, hello. Because you're Mike Rickle. He goes, yeah. He goes, did you know uh, Benny Hinn's in town? I go, right here in Toronto. No, I didn't know it. He said, Benny Hinn has heard some stories. He wants to meet you. And uh, would you, could you meet him? He, the guy's talking to me privately. Could you meet him tomorrow? I go, let me check the preaching schedule. I'm free. I said, okay. So I go over there, meet Benny Hinn. We used to talk for a little while, and he goes, hey, I hear A, B, and C. Is that true? I go, A and B is not true, and C, D is true, but E is the real good part. Okay. <laughs> now, we had a good time of talking. So, I'm sitting on the front row, just kind of mind my own business, kind of looking at the time, because I got a meeting with some leaders at a little while, and maybe it's 11 o'clock in the morning, and and uh, Benny's up in a place is you know, 20,000, Toronto, and I'm just sitting on the front row, and Benny Hand goes, he goes, I have a good friend here. And, uh, and he meant that sincerely with affection. And I don't know he's talking about me. And I'm looking around, and he says, I'd like him to come up here and just kind of address the people. And uh, he says, Mike Bickle, would you come up here? And I'm going, ah! <laughs> Now I was kind of like getting ready for my message in the afternoon back at, with John Arnott on the other side of town. I'm kind of a little, okay. That which I do is being done to me at this moment. And so uh, that what I've done to others. So I walk up there. And I'm going to just say some little, one thing I'm sure I'm not going to do is go on and on. I have enough class that if somebody gives you a platform, get in and out in 90 seconds. You know, I'm not going to go on and on and, you know. So I'm just going to be as brief as could be. I'm going to say, isn't it amazing? This is what's in my heart. Walking up. John Arnott, Holy Spirit on the right side of the town. You're on the left side of town. Holy Spirit, isn't it? The Holy Spirit. And I, and I get up there and I'm, and I'm going to say, isn't it amazing? And I switch gears and the spirit of prophecy comes on me. <laughs> I get up there and I said, I was going to be kind and just quick, and I go, in the name of Jesus, God is raising up intercessors all over the earth, all over North America. The Spirit of God is moving, and I prophesied, in essence, the house of prayer. I didn't call it the house of prayer. I go, that is on his agenda, and the place just started roaring and screaming, and everybody jumped up, and I mean, and I just went on and on for about 90 seconds and said, amen, put the microphone down, and went and sat down. And I said to myself, that was the Lord. <laughs> I mean, it was, it just, whew, there it was. And I'm sitting there and I go, I gave this prophecy somewhere. Where did I give this prophecy? No, I didn't give it. A, not when our Kansas City conference. Oh my goodness. It was the dream in 93. I said, oh my goodness. I don't say this out loud, but I'm going, they think I'm getting the spirit or something. I'm over there just. I am really, I'm going, oh my goodness. I, I, I did this once. So, I, I am aware I'm in a divine transition. I, uh, no one from John Arnold's conference is there. Because they're all caught up in the thing. I get to John Arnold's conference, I do my little session or whatever. And uh, no one says a word. I'm there the evening meeting, and we're all there. All the ministries are there. Hi, am I going to see you? You know, and nobody even knew I was over there, you know, because the two different worlds were going on and a lot of busy schedules. So they're on the front row, and Frank Damasio was preaching. Fantastic message. And at the end, he said, I mean, the place, 7,000 people were about to explode. They were so like horses, where to get. It. And he says, Let's stand in the place. You All he had to do was say, Jesus, in the thing with the power of God. I mean, we're talking about the Toronto Conference crowd ready. You don't got to get them ready. They're ready. They're ready when they get there. Easiest group on the earth to preach to. And so, I know for real it is. I'm not saying it for real. They are so ready when they get there. They've been getting beat up by everybody back home because of the spirit. And when they get there, they're just a whole bunch of drunks together in a fraternity. They are having a ball with all their guards down. And their guard hadn't been down for a long time because they're getting the tar beat out of them back home. And, I mean, it is intense. Drop a match, the whole thing explodes. <laughs> and, he's, and Frank Demise goes, all right, let's go. And everybody stands up. And it is, I go, oh, this is going to be the rowdiest. He's going to say Jesus. And, I mean, it's going to get so rowdy. The main prophet of Toronto stands up, Mark DuPont, 
comes up, and I go, oh, Mark, not now. It's flowing. It's happening. It's happening. Not now. He gets up. He goes, okay. And, and he takes the microphone. He goes, everybody sit down. And I'm going, bad, bad. <laughs> he's the main prophet guy there. That everybody, so I know he knows what he's doing. He says, sit down. He goes, I have to do this. I asked John, and John said, absolutely. We have to. I thought, this better be good. He goes, Mike Bickle, come up here. That's two times in one day. I go, ah! I come up there and he says, brother, he says, the Lord is on me so strong right now. He goes, you're in a time of transition right now. He goes, and the Lord's confirming it to you right now. Of course, he did that morning. He didn't, nobody knew that. Nobody knew about the dream in Toronto. And he said, God's about to introduce you into a new team. He said, God's about to set you in a new ministry. He goes, God's about to begin a worldwide dimension that you have no comprehension of the magnitude of it. He goes, you're going to have a new message. You're going to have a, there's going to be a new team you're connected with. There's going to be new global boundaries. And this is the hour, 1996. And uh, I came back home and I knew that I had heard from God and I knew the transition was on, and it was alive, and it was well. And so uh, I come back home, and 1997, 1998, uh, I go on that uh, Bill Bright fast. I'm in Toronto, and they give the vision for the Bill Bright fast, the 40-day thing. And I go, oh, man, I don't want to do a 40-day fast. I mean, it was they said a 40-day juice fast. So I thought, man, that's a long time. Even on juice, that's a long time. I said, I, I don't really think I want to. And they pressed it and pressed it and pressed it. And Wes Campbell got in my face. You got to do it. If you don't do it, you can't call others. That's your life message. I said, okay, okay, okay. I'm in, I think. Give me a day to think about it. I, I want it to be a God thing. I don't want to just do it. I mean, Wes Campbell won't take no for an answer. So, But it, the Lord confirmed it. So I come home. I got the book. We get a bunch of them. Give them to everybody. I go, starting January, we're, we're going to do it. And I'm going to do it on juice, for sure. You know, I said, there's no way. That I'm just, you know, I'm doing it because Bill Bright called it, and he's one of the main guys in the world, in the kingdom. He's a papa. He said, do it. Let's just do it. And so we sent it to the whole church. We get the books to tons of people. And so I'm on this fast, and I said, I'll do a couple days on water. So I go a few days on water, and then I get to 10. And, and the reason I say this about water, because it's, it's a supernatural thing where the Lord just keeps pressing this. Because there's, it's a whole different dimension. And then at day 10, the Lord says longer. And I go to 20 and then to 30. I did the whole thing on a water fast. And, and, and the reason I'm saying it, I'm not saying that to be uh, heroic. Because uh, uh, there's so many fasters, far greater fasters outside the kingdom of God all around the world. And all those Eastern religions. And many, many anointed fasters beyond anything I could conceive of in the kingdom. I know a, a number of them. I mean real serious fasters. And so I'm not saying that to make a hot shot point, but I'm saying it to make this. I knew something was going on because it's birth canal again. It's transition. It's birth canal. I've been on three long extended fasts like that, and every one of them launched an entirely new realm. And beloved, I'm going to end it with now. I'm not even halfway done with the story, but I got a ton more to tell you. And we'll, you know, the good part about IHOP, we go 24 7 and we have meetings every week. So just because next week, because I'm going to give the main word next week, I can still tell you the rest of these stories in another, on Sunday nights. We don't have to quit, do we? We are going to tell you the rest. There's a lot more stories to tell you. I don't even have to tell them in a row, but I do want to tell them to you. But, uh, I want to say this, that, uh, 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 what was I going to say? Transition. Anyway, stand up. Let's just, we're, I'm ready. I'm ready to go.